This presentation will cover the basics of vitamin D testing. It will start with vitamin D structure and function and a discussion of the clinical utility of vitamin D. Next, we'll focus on vitamin D testing and issues with measurement. And finally, it'll cover vitamin D supplementation, toxicity, deficiency, and clinical targets. Vitamin D broadly refers to a number of different fat-soluble compounds known as secosteroids. These include vitamin D proper, which occurs in two forms, vitamin D2 on the left, and vitamin D3 second from the left. Vitamin D2 and D3 differ by a double bond between carbons 22 and 23, and a methyl group on carbon 24. These vitamins are biologically inactive. They are enzymatically converted to an intermediate compound, 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which in turn serves as a pool for the biologically active form of the vitamin called 125-hydroxyvitamin D. The key differences between these forms are highlighted with the blue circles. This table shows the concentrations of vitamin D, the intermediate compound 25-hydroxyvitamin D, and the bioactive compound 125-hydroxyvitamin D in circulation. Half-lives, control, and the percent free are also indicated. 25-hydroxyvitamin D has a relatively long half-life, higher relative concentration, and is unregulated, making it the best compound to determine a patient's overall vitamin D status. This point is worth emphasizing as labs often see orders for other forms of vitamin D even when the goal is to assess vitamin D stores. Many labs end up reviewing or restricting orders for 125-hydroxyvitamin D as it has a narrow but valid clinical utility. Vitamin D synthesis occurs through many steps. It begins with the conversion of a cholesterol derivative through sunlight or radiation yielding vitamin D. Both D2 and D3 forms of vitamin D are converted to 25-hydroxyvitamin D in the liver by the enzyme 25-hydroxylase. 25-hydroxyvitamin D is in turn converted to 125-hydroxyvitamin D, the active compound, by 1-alpha-hydroxylase in the kidney. The 1-alpha-hydroxylase enzyme is positively regulated, among other things, by parathyroid hormone. From the synthesis diagram, you can infer that either liver or kidney damage will affect the availability of vitamin D. Likewise, inadequate exposure to sunlight will also cause deficiency in the absence of supplementation. Supplements containing both vitamin D2 and D3 are available and will be discussed later. Vitamin D has a number of functions in the body. The best known function of vitamin D is controlling circulating calcium and phosphate. Produced primarily by the kidney, 125-hydroxyvitamin D directly increases intestinal absorption of both calcium and phosphorus, increasing their concentrations in circulation. 125-hydroxyvitamin D is also involved in bone formation, resorption, and mineralization. The mechanisms of bone remodeling are quite complex and beyond the scope of this short vignette. It is clear that in patients with osteoporosis, the risk of bone fracture is inhibited by vitamin D supplementation along with calcium. Vitamin D is also known to play an important role in immune regulation and has an emerging role in neuromuscular and cardiovascular function. It also has a role in proliferation of soft tissues. In fact, most cells in the body express vitamin D receptors and many express the converting enzyme 1-alpha-hydroxylase. You can be certain to hear more about this pleiotropic hormone in the years to come. 25-hydroxyvitamin D is the best molecule to measure for assessment of overall vitamin D status. It is decreased with low exposure to sunlight, inadequate dietary intake, malabsorption, and liver disease. It is increased with toxicity, which occurs exclusively through dietary intake, such as oversupplementation. Prolonged exposure to sunlight does not cause toxicity, as the excess is converted into inactive compounds, such as 24-25-vitamin D. As far as test utilization, it is important to consider when to test for vitamin D deficiency. While supplementation has a clear role in several disorders, such as bone disease, to my knowledge, there is little clinical evidence demonstrating that actually measuring vitamin D improves clinical outcomes. This is a topic of active research. Not to be entirely discounted, 125-hydroxyvitamin D does have some specific clinical utility. It is useful for detecting granulomatous diseases, such as sarcoidosis, differentiation of different types of rickets, and for some types of hyperparathyroidism.
There are many hundreds of studies which have assessed vitamin D deficiency in various populations, disease categories, and ethnicities around the world. Shown here are a few examples reviewed by Hollick in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. While some define deficiency as less than 25 nanograms per milliliter or less than 50 nanomoles per liter, it is worth recognizing that these definitions differ between studies as do methods of measurement, making comparisons a bit challenging. These issues are discussed later in this presentation. Nevertheless, there appears to be a very high prevalence of 25 hydroxy vitamin D deficiency globally, with estimates of 1 billion people worldwide. There are a number of factors which contribute to deficiency. For example, darker skinned individuals with low exposure to sunlight living at high latitudes who have low dietary intake of vitamin D are very likely to have low levels. This audience will appreciate that medical residents are at risk for vitamin D deficiency due to the lifestyle afforded them by the demands of their work. This figure shows seasonal variation in vitamin D levels for individuals in the Northern Hemisphere. Given the mechanism of vitamin D synthesis, it is not surprising that levels drop in the winter months, where lower UV radiation exists in northern climates. In fact, without dietary intake, it is impossible to convert the cholesterol derivative into 25-hydroxy vitamin D for many months of the year. This is because photolysis of the 7-dehydroxy cholesterol to 25-hydroxy vitamin in the skin requires radiation in the UVB range 290 to 315 nanometers. At latitudes North or south of 37 degrees, there is insufficient radiation for this conversion in the winter. Sunburn remains possible, but not vitamin D conversion. In Boston, home to the editor of Clinical Chemistry, there is a period between November through February where conversion of vitamin D in the skin will not occur. Further north or south to 52 degrees, for example in Edmonton, Canada, or parts of the UK, this ineffective winter period runs from October through March. One question many laboratorians will be asked is, which form of vitamin D should be measured? Assuming that we want to measure someone's overall vitamin D status, it is important to consider whether we want to measure vitamin D2, vitamin D3, or both. Again, these are the 25 hydroxy forms of the vitamin to which I'm referring. The answer to this question really depends on your patient population. If you have patients who are taking vitamin D2 supplements, principally in the prescribed form, it is going to be important to identify vitamin D2 to detect the rare cases of toxicity. However, management of overall vitamin D status is based on total vitamin D levels, so it's certainly important to report at least the total. Another consideration is whether clinicians will be able to appreciate the subtleties of the differences between reporting vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. It is useful to provide interpretive comments on reports to help users understand the results. Others have advocated for providing a total hydroxy vitamin D level and only differentiating forms in the context of total excess. Once it is understood what to measure, the next step is to choose how to measure it. Available methods for vitamin D measurement include radioimmunoassays, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, enhanced chemiluminescence, and protein binding assays. Also available are chromatography-based methods including HPLC, GCMS, and LCMSMS. There are issues with measurement by any of these methods. Immunoassays are not capable of detecting both vitamin D2 and D3 with equal efficacy. In fact, some methods are incapable of detecting vitamin D2 at all. There is also a lack of traceability and generally poor agreement between the various platforms. Chromatography-based methods are not immune to problems either. They suffer from lack of standardization and are subject to interference from the C3 epimer. C3 epimer is a compound of unknown clinical significance, which is a structural mirror image of the 25-hydroxy form that is the desired target for measurement. This figure illustrates the effect of differential detection of vitamin D between methods. Beginning with the red line, the proportion of people deficient for vitamin D at 50 nanograms per liter is much higher than it would be with a different assay. Although these differences are exaggerated to emphasize the point here, it is important to consider that the appropriate reference interval should be used for your assay. These differences also highlight challenges in defining a global definition of deficiency and in comparing research between different methods. The N. Haynes National Health and Nutrition Survey was famously affected by an assay reformulation, which made it appear that there was a dramatic decline in vitamin D levels over time. Vitamin D testing is fraught with challenges.
Most vitamin D supplements on the market are of the D3 variety. Many concentrations are available depending on the brand and source. Laboratorians do need to be aware that D2 is also available. Largely, this is as a prescription for 50,000 units, which is available only in the U.S. By only available in the U.S., that means they can also be obtained over the Internet in other countries around the world. As for the amount that should be consumed, there are many different guidelines beyond the scope of this presentation. Suffice to state that patients with bone disease are generally accepted to have higher requirements and that vitamin D taken with calcium has more potent effects on fracture risk reduction. As far as toxicity, there are no reports of adverse effects for daily doses at or below 10,000 international units of D2 or D3 per day. Doses of 4,000 international units per day for three months and 50,000 international units per week for two months have also been administered without toxicity. Another question about supplementation is whether the D2 or D3 form is more potent. A paper by Hollick et al. in 2007 showed equivalent doses using 1,000 international units per day. A more recent study in JCEM by Haney et al. in 2011 shows greater potency of vitamin D3. Potency here is defined as higher measurable 25-hydroxy in circulation. The difference between the studies was that the more recent paper used higher doses of vitamin D than the Hollick study. The more recent study was based on giving 50,000 international units of the vitamin per week. D2 was given at a dose of 50,000 units once per week, and D3 was given five times per week at a dose of 10,000 international units. Another study of children with nutritional rickets, published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research in 2010, suggests that an increase in serum 25-hydroxy vitamin is prolonged with D3 supplementation as opposed to D2 supplementation. However, controlled children did not demonstrate a difference between 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels between supplements. Collectively, the evidence points to greater efficacy of D3 supplementation in certain doses and clinical contexts. If you assume that we can agree upon which method to measure vitamin D, the clinical targets still remain the subject of debate. It is reported that a serum vitamin D level of less than 20 nanograms per mil, or 50 nanomoles per liter, indicates deficiency. Concentrations between 30 and 60 nanograms per mil are considered to indicate sufficiency based on data from immunoassays. Finally, the toxic concentration is considered above 150 nanograms per mil. Regardless of the vitamin D level, it should be interpreted in the context of other tests such as calcium, phosphate, and parathyroid hormone. Ongoing research is likely to further define and refine these intervals. In summary, vitamin D has an emerging role in several disease states. People with vitamin D deficiency are at risk for a number of different diseases beyond just osteoporosis. To assess overall vitamin D status, 25-hydroxy vitamin D should be measured. As a laboratorian, it is important to know which test you are using and what it measures, to be aware of issues of standardization, and to employ an appropriate reference interval for your test. Likewise, an awareness of vitamin D forms and supplements is necessary for test selection and result interpretation.